and finally if you want to collaborate with us um, you can scan this qr code which is on your screen and you can join a community um, so we uh, we function on our slack so you can join women who code data science on our slack but you can also find us on linkedin twitter instagram and facebook and again you'll find all the all the relevant links in the chat as well all right now it's time to welcome our speaker for today so archana vaidisharam she's a data product manager at women who code and she's a passionate advocate for women in technology she's recognized as a fellow by the python software foundation for her commitment to leveraging python in ai and data science she has delivered engaging talks at conferences like fos asia uh, women who code connect and sci-fi 2023 and she has a broad perspective on the role of ai and data across various sectors she has experienced leading a thriving community of Python enthusiasts as a woman who code leadership fellow, and she's here to help you navigate and understand the complex world of large language models. Um, a very warm welcome to you, Archana. Uh, I shall now pass on the floor to you. Welcome. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for such an amazing presentation, Siddhi, and also like for waking up super early to do this. I really, really appreciate it. And yeah, I hope uh, everyone has a fun session today. Um, yeah, let me go ahead and share my slides. One second. Oh, can you see my screen? Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Uh, okay, okay, awesome. Yeah, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank, thank you so much for joining in. I know the webinar sort of reads advanced applications and maybe that also is a bit uh, intimidating but um, you know not to worry this uh, this session is going to be really fun and we're going to make sure that everyone walks away with something that they have learned today and as usual I make sure like most of my sessions are inclusive they are um, they are something that e that is easy for beginners to understand and most importantly through these sessions and making sure that our community is also you know moving forward in this I, I guess like this new realm of what NLP is and what uh, you know I, I'm like as the world sort of gets used to using GPT sort of models and using it day to day uh, we as a community we know what it is actually about and what makes GPT what it is today right and um, and okay, also I want to say I'm really sorry about the long wait. Um, I took a small vacation, uh, actually like a pretty big vacation, I should say, but yeah, like a two week vacation at uh, Japan. It's a very beautiful country. I don't know if you've been there or if anyone is joining us from there, but yeah, um, it's been a very fun experience and I've learned a lot. <laughs> so yeah, sorry about the long wait between the last session and this one. And I hope that, you know, that you do remember some things, but it's okay if you don't. We'll also make sure that, you know, uh, we recap the session. And um, so goals for this presentation is basically be able to, um, like, firstly, be able to introduce what is RLHF, which is like reinforcement learning, human feedback, and reward modeling. I think like uh, in the past sessions, we have covered pre-training, we have covered fine tuning, we have covered prompt engineering. And uh, now we come behind like the secret source of GPT, right? Like what makes chat GPT so well right now? And why is it able to, like, obviously we have realized there's a bit of prompt engineering involved. That's why it's able to talk. And uh, that's how it's able to respond when we give it uh, like specific, like, questions but now we come to the fact that what makes it better right than other models out there and why is it like this method worked and why is it like we didn't have gpt long back and why did we uh, come like why did we suddenly have this sort of new models and i mean it's not only gpt there are other sort of large language models which are also using rlhf now but why is it that this particular thing works so that's what we're going to be introducing today and um and most importantly, I think like, again, like design choices, right? When should you progress into using RLHF, right? Because uh, I am giving you some, like, you know, some idea today, some information today. Uh, what What is more important is how you utilize it, right? And 
you're going to be asking yourself a lot of questions whether it is necessary to utilize it or whether it's not in your project or your work as such so i think that's what we'll also be giving like those design choices and finally be able to do like a simple rlhf and i want to introduce soham here right now so soham will help you do like a simple rlhf and he set up a notebook uh for that uh yeah hi everyone um yeah excited to be here and um, yeah that's it. okay uh, awesome let's get started and uh, feel free to ask questions along the way so today's like is advanced applications of llms but just to recap the last presentation as usual you know we love to do like fun quizzes so that it uh, sort of i guess it revises us or also figures out like what we remember so the first question of today is what is prompt engineering uh feel free to use the chat again like i know like everyone's learning journey is different so don't worry if you don't immediately get the answer the it, it's more important that you walk away with the information right and you get to learn something new so it's okay it's perfectly fine if you weren't able to uh get the answer so today's first question is what is prompt engineering is it a a way of training drugs a method to teach parrots to sing Uh, or is is it C a process of guiding large language uh, models to generate desired outputs, or last a technique for fine tuning AI models? So feel free to use the chat. Awesome, yeah, it is C. Oh, yeah, it is C. Um, so um, like just to recap, like you know, what is prompt engineering? So imagine like you're training your pet to perform tricks, and if you want your dog to sit, you just yell sit once. Um, it it might not work, right? You will have to do it like repeat it several times, uh, rewarding it for the good behavior until your pet understands the command. So the prompt engineering is similar. It's a way of teaching the computer program to understand and respond to certain inputs or prompts. the better prompts the better the computer's output so like you might just instead of yell uh, sit one time you might be like can you please sit or maybe you might use like variations of saying sit right and that's what this is about prompt engineering is about and in more technical terms so prompt engineering involves creating inputs that guide a large language model like chat gpt to generate the desired output and it's an essential skill for developers now Uh, allowing them to effectively use llms for tasks like text generation question answering summarization and etc and the key is in understanding how these model process input and tailor those inputs to get the best result so um i think like going forward as we start using llm models even like if we call an api or if we actually you know and which i don't think is feasible unless you're working in a place which can afford computational resources but if you train your own llm from scratch you would still require to use prompt engineering and so it becomes like an essential skill right now and i i i do believe if you're working with nlp so another thing is uh, yeah another question for today so imagine you're a wizard who just conjured a um, large model turned magic parrot when would you not perform prompt engineering uh, you're entering the parrot in a contest where it needs to recite a specific charm you want the parrot to sing a rare ancient song that only elves know you are just enjoying its random magical words and incantation or you want the parrot to learn a new spell never tried before So the question is, when would you not perform prompt engineering? So let me check the chat. You can go ahead and try. It's okay. I know it's a bit difficult, but go ahead and try. Awesome. Yeah, it is C. So you um. So there are instances where you would not require to do prompt engineering. Uh, I always like try to do my presentation with both. I give you design choices as to when to do it and when not to do it. so when not to do it is when you are having like simple queries maybe having just open ended conversations with your model or, or like if you are having limited resources which means like you don't have like extensive testing time or refining prompts etc it might not be worth getting into prompt engineering 
Okay, uh, another question for the day is, imagine you're teaching a robot to bake a zero shot learning cake. What does this mean? So it's more like uh, we covered types of prompt engineering before. If you don't remember, it's perfectly fine as well. But uh, maybe you can try to guess. Either way, we will go through the concept again. So uh, is it A, you give the robot a recipe, but no examples of a finished cake? B, you provide examples of a few finished cakes, but no recipe. You ask the robot to bake the cake without providing any recipe or example. You provide a detailed step-by-step -step instruction along with pictures of each stage of the cake baking process. I know this is a bit tough. Oh, yeah, it's actually B. You provide a few examples of the finished cake, but no recipe. So why? Why is it zero shot learning, right? Um, so prompting in the context of large language model refers to the input or instructions that we give to the model. The prompt is what guides the model to sort of create a certain response. And basic prompting like gives the task to the model without providing like specific structure and additional context such as, you know, translate this English sentence to French or write a poem about spring. So you know, you're doing as minimal as possible. So the model uses like its prior training data to understand the language to generate a response. It might be good. It might not be good. It purely depends on what it was trained on. And uh, so zero shot learning involves feeding the task directly to the model without any prior example. Just like asking your friend a question out of the blue and expecting them to answer it accurately. And so zero shot learning is a concept in machine learning where a model like predicts or does decision about unseen data without any prior example. So that's what it is. So in this case, it's like asking it to bake it without showing it like, you know, end results. And the last question for the day is, imagine you're a detective and you've been given a case to solve. To do this, you ask a language model, your assistant several interconnected questions. Which prompt engineering technique is it? Is it A, basic prompting, B, self-consistency sampling, C, chain of thought prompting, or D, instruction prompting? And again, feel free to guess. And don't worry if you feel like, oh, I got the last one wrong or something. It's fine. I, I feel like these questions are a bit more tough than I usually put out. Yeah, I think most of you got it right. That's amazing. So it is chain of thought prompting. So uh, just to sort of refresh, so what is chain of thought prompting? So imagine you're playing a game of 20 questions with your AI or your model, right? You wanted to guess what you're thinking, right? And uh, so you wanted to guess that, oh, you're thinking of an elephant. So what you do is you don't want it to, you don't want to tell it like, oh, it's an elephant, but you make the model guess that it is. So you start giving it hints, right? First, you might say it's a large animal. Maybe it has a long trunk. It has some floppy ears. It lives in Asia and Africa. So then you're adding like a bit more information. So that way, like it's able to guess correctly that, yeah, it's an uh, elephant. So, oh, sorry. Yeah, so that is what is chain of thought prompting as such. And that's how you sort of do it with models as well. You give it like some context information one after the other and hope it comes to the right conclusion through it. Okay, uh, this brings us to the end of the recap of the presentation as such. And the next section is going through RLHF. I think um, it's made like the world, uh, I think yesterday as well, me and Soham were discussing. It's so intuitive and it's pretty like you would, act, when you go through it, like, apart from if you were to get into the math, you would actually end up saying that, oh, it actually sounds something which is very intuitive. And I'm surprised they didn't do this before. And that's actually true. What they have done with RLHF is quite intuitive and quite frankly makes it fun, right? So yeah, let's get into it. So um, so the genesis like of RLHF, or why did it came into play, right? And um, so it is inspired by a very fun blog by Chip Huen. You can just search like Chip Huen RLHF and you'll get it. Uh, I've like pretty much also like gone through her blog and got this presentation from that. And it's very well written and she gets into the math as well. Um, so, oh yeah. Coming over here, like, I guess you remember, if you remember this image, we, uh, this is from another talk by uh, Andrej Karpati at OpenAI, where I think it was like state of GPT talk, where he talked about this GPT assistant training pipeline. 
so we did cover pre training and fine tuning before but now we are talking about reward modeling and reinforcement learning and what it means in terms of nlp so okay um so like in a story like fashion imagine like you know reinforcement learning and nlp were like two different regions or countries having its own language customs and techniques and they progressed independently each facing its own challenge so what was reinforcement learning so reinforcement learning is all about training a model to make a specific decision by rewarding it for good ones and punishing it for bad ones and it's often used in gaming uh, and simulated environments and nlp on the other hand you must know is nlp like it's all about understanding human languages interpreting them making sense of what people say or write right and what was the problem with uh, rl world it was actually difficult to work with it was great with games and simulation but when it came to dealing with complexity and the nuances of human language it had a tough time so then something amazing happened uh, the researchers figured out a way to combine these two fields so they started using reinforcement learning to improve natural language processing and this is what is called like reinforcement learning from human feedback so what does it mean with a simple example right so let's go back to training your dog right so uh, you want to make the dog learn how to sit right previously what we said with prompt engineering is that i would say sit in various ways until maybe the dog gets it for example my cat uh, i usually say come but i have to like say like a for, like if i want the uh, cat to come towards me i'll be like come uh, and my cat's name is copper so i would be like come copper and then like sometimes he would listen but sometimes he wouldn't and then i would like figure out a way around it and i would be like can you please come and you know we um, we use different prompts to make it learn but sometimes what works is like if you give a treat right if you end up giving the for example the dog treat when it sits it corresponds it to okay i sat so i got this particular treat so it learns to associate the word sit to a reward coming and this is how basically reinforcement learning works and now like let's, let's apply it to language right so when you're working with human generated text you feed it a sentence which is like a prompt and and the model generates a continuation of the response right so when you what we learned even like with pre training and just to sort of recap is that often times the pre pre trained models will try to complete sentences right they are not great at talking like humans but if you write it a sentence it will try to complete it and that's how it's able to guess what the next word is and so if the generated response is good you end up giving the model a reward if it's not you don't give it a reward so over time the model learns to generate better text because it's it wants to get the reward and that is exactly what is rlhf for reinforcement learning human feedback in action so what are the stages of this rlf uh, rlhf right like how does it really work out and um, how do we come to this and i'm going to go through things that we have probably done before but that's how we came to where we have right now so um so imagine you are you having like a uh, you know very a very intelligent parrot right and this parrot can maybe signify the model initially the parrot learns to mimic human language by listening to lots of different people talk so this is like the pre training phase right phase uh, where it just is listening to other people talk and then you to make it talk more co coherently and sensibly you might want it to take up an active role so she show it specific sentence and how they sound and this is supervised fine tuning and but okay so now you say you're teaching it to respond to a question right so what's the weather like and the parrot comes up with two different replies um a it comes up with a response it's raining cats and dogs and b it says bananas are yellow and you clearly prefer even though like uh both a and b might not be the correct answer but you prefer answer a over response b and by doing this you're indicating which behavior is better and this is a basic form of reward modeling uh, and in the context of um, like llms this reward is usually a numerical value and then you, in terms of the last stage is reinforcement learning human feedback you want the parrot to go beyond the mimicry you want it to have meaningful conversation so you start giving it treat when it responds well to a conversation and gently correct it when it 
say something out of context of gibberish. And the parrot starts to sort of understand the difference between good and bad responses based on your feedback. And so you do this iteratively until sort of the parrot has conversational abilities over time. And I know like I've, I've reduced a very large language model to a single parrot, but it's a good analogy to understand like what is going behind this, this massive model as such. So this is uh, a diagram that again, I took from the blog uh, of Chip Huen. So um, it's actually like it breaks down this assisted pipeline in a very, uh, very well-defined manner. So what you have here is firstly the pre-training phrase as I talked about before with like the parrot just listening, right? So, um, so with large language model, uh, it's trying to learn to predict the next word in the sentence by ingesting like massive amounts of data from the internet. And this exposure to varied data lays the groundwork for the model's understanding of language, right? Uh, of, of the knowledge about the world and ability to create creative texts. And that's where you need to realize that's where the magic happens, right? Like the fact that it's able to do it creatively is what sets it apart. And so that's where it's the pre-training phase. And next we come to like supervised fine tuning. So if you see the block diagram here, it's demonstration data, and then you give it like supervised fine tuning, and then it creates the model. So supervised fine tuning is that you provide like human trainers, provide the model with specific examples of interaction to help it understand how it can respond to different prompts. So now it has all the data it has learned from the internet, but now you make it understand this is how interactions happen. And so now you're fine tuning the model to Make it, make it close, uh, sound close to what chat GPT is, right? So this process hones the model's ability to generate more useful and coherent responses. And finally, uh, we come to the last two stages. The first one is like reward modeling, right? So reward modeling is reinforcement learning uh, in a way to guide the model's learning process. So as I said, you reward, here is a reward function that is created that assigns a numerical score to the possible outputs generated by the model in response to a specific prompt. So how does it end up doing that, right? Uh, so to create this model, what, developers do is they create several model responses to a variety of prompts and have human evaluators rank these uh, in terms of quality and relevance. So let me go back to the GPT pipeline here just to sort of, uh, if you look over here, right, I think they did explain that they had, uh, they had a lot of like people who, uh, so yeah, so there's a lot of, if you see, there's something called comparisons if you look at how GPT did it, and they actually had a lot of like contractors who worked to create these comparison data, which were low in quantity, but high in quality. So that's exactly what we are trying to cover here is that you have these developers who are creating these responses, these wide variety of prompts and have these human uh, evaluators sort of contractors. So actually OpenAI would have hired a lot of contractors to rank these responses. And uh, over time, the model starts generating more of the response that gets higher reward and thus uh, improving overall performance. So how does it end up doing that? Right? Like what do you end up creating? So you end up creating something called comparison data. So what is comparison data? Is that it's some, it looks something like the table on your right hand side, right? Uh, for example, you give it the prompt, like what is the capital of, capital of France, right? Uh, if it says capital of France is Paris, which it is, you end up saying that, yeah, it's a winning response. But if it says it's Berlin, you say it's a losing response. So human lab, uh, lab, labeler who would actually like go label and would say that, okay, the first response is more appropriate since it's correct. And the second one is like a losing response. So you end up rewarding the first one and reduce like saying the second one does not get the reward. And the winning response is the correct answer and the losing one is incorrect. And so the challenge here is that, yeah, I mean, like when you hear it, you're like, what if, I mean, like right now I was dependent on LLMs because I thought like they, they had like all the knowledge of the world, but humans are prone to errors, right? That's, that's true. We are prone to errors, but, uh, you know, at the same time, believe it or not, we are the ones who are trying to sort of, uh, put the boundary along, uh, along LLMs and also trying to figure out how to make them sound closer to humans. So yeah, you actually do need a lot of humans. Uh, you need you need them to label the data, figure out which ones are right, which one are wrong. So yeah, there, there is 
a lot of this that went behind creating what chat gpt is today as well so for example a response that is humorous might be considered a winning response in a casual conversation but could be considered a losing response in a far in a more formal or serious context so it it does become a bit complex with more complicated prompts but the idea is that by giving it a few responses or making it understand that yeah you should be taking this path the llm eventually learns how to do it well and how to take these paths every time a question is given to it and um okay the last stage is finally like reinforcement learning human feedback and the model learns feedback on its performance so the model generates multiple responses to any given prompt and um this is a fun way in which like andrej karpati also explained this he said like the model takes up various alleys like a various alleys to come up with a response so when you actually ask it a simple question like even like what is the capital of france it might have actually generated multiple responses and then you have these human evaluators that rank these responses and because it's been learned it's learned how to rank these responses in the past it's able to guess the right answer when you actually give it the question and so progressively it's actually able to do better because it's been ranked by humans so now we come to this part which often times might ha happen when you actually interact with llms like even chat gpt you would have seen it uh, it's the concept of hallucinations so what are hallucinations right oh, okay so imagine now you have this model or this child uh, that you're trying to teach the difference between right and wrong answers to a question right because it's clearly it knows a lot of data from the internet but we we still need to make sure it's able to differentiate right from the wrong and accurate from inaccurate and so on so you present a question then two different answer one one is correct that's the winning response and one is incorrect that's the losing response so you tell the child that the correct answer is the better one later when the child sort of faces similar question they should remember the lessons they have sort of learned and aim to choose the answer that resembles the winning one right but mistakes can happen right so uh, one of these mistakes is hallucination so imagine you're playing the game of telephone i don't know if you uh, played it before so you whisper a message to the next person and they pass it along right but by the time the message gets to the last person it's usually altered often humorously so and this change can happen because the person interprets and conveys the message a bit differently so in the world of llms we say the model is hallucinating when it starts to generate information that wasn't in the original out input but much like the players in the game this can be problematic because it's going to end up making like give like made up information so it means like as it went through this very large language model to actually give you the answer to your question somewhere it it picked up the wrong answer or it like you know it ended up with the wrong alleys and it uh, gave you the wrong conclusion overall but what can happen is that this like this in like wrong information or inappropriate information as such can actually be the model can be giving it confidently as well and um so in essential it's making things up right and there's a couple of reasons why this can happen one is lack of casual understanding so it suggests that you know llms hallucinate because they don't understand the cause and effect of their actions right they just try to take what they thought was the best part to get to your answer so they don't inherently comprehend that their answer should be casually linked to the input in uh, prompts hence they might produce outputs that might seem unlinked to the input or create like a hallucination effect and secondly this mismatch of knowledge so this hypothesis like is like says that hallucination occurs due to difference in understanding between human laborer and the model so when the llm is trained to mimic human responses like during the uh, supervised fine tuning phase it might start to generate outputs that appear as if the knowledge it doesn't actually possess so it can end up leading leading to hallucination so one of the proposed solution for this is to have a better reward function during the rlhf process for instance the model can be
punished for making things up encouraging it to ground its responses more closely to the training data but despite like because these models are so huge and it's impossible to sort of predict what part it took to actually get your answer it can still hallucinate and hallucination is one of the major problems with llms right now and if you've interacted enough with gpt you know that eventually it will start giving you you know uh, some of the other wrong answers and even if it gives you wrong answers it might confidently end up saying that it is the wrong answer so you end up questioning yourself whether does that is it really wrong or am i thinking or is the llm right so it's always good to uh, i know like even open ai puts up this disclaimer in the bottom saying that you know it can end up saying something misleading and that's where it happens it hallucinates so it's always good to end up like using like the internet as a better like source of information like you go back to the internet check whether it's right so you know after the child has some understanding of right and wrong answers then we engage in practice session we ask the child to new questions and guide them to provide the best answer based on learning if they deviate far from what they've been taught we correct them ensuring they maintain the right learning path and so the practice session represent the reinforcement learning phase and helping the child or llm to strengthen and apply their understanding so yeah uh, i i'll take up a few questions right now but uh, sohum do you want to add anything else or maybe like i know like uh, we we didn't go back and forth on this content much but did i miss anything uh no i think that was actually really good um i see that there is uh, one question which is how does a model respond to a reward if it is not alive um so so maybe i can i can explain this um so how the reward works is um um uh, in in context of um rlhf is um you give the model um uh, you need um some kind uh, uh, something to provide you with um, a metric or a number um, as to which output is correct or like better than the other one if that makes sense so so let's say you have a model um, and you ask it to generate two or three or or you know multiple outputs and then you can then use another function um or a program or even a human to rate the answers and um uh, to tell you like which answer is better right um so that that uh, uh, and that becomes the reward uh, and and then how you train the model is um you you train it to uh, generate those answers that the uh, that the human says is is better right um and 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 how you do that is uh, you can use a function um or um you, you can use something that compares uh two uh, outputs from the model and you see the distance between like what the ideal output should be and what like uh what the output that the model generated um i, I think i'm making this very complex um <laughs> um so so yeah so so someone else asked uh, so a human tells it which answer is better yes um uh, you have a uh, you have um, a base model um that you use to generate many answers then you can use a human it doesn't have to be a human you can use um another uh, another program or some um some metrics or or you know in case of rlhf you can also use a human um to to rate the answers and then you train the model uh, to generate answers uh, um that got higher rating right so so the model what it tries to do is it generates an answer then you compare with the ideal answer and you try to um reduce the distance between the answers so so that's what the reward is the reward is um the distance or how far the two answers uh, 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 how similar the two answers are and and you try to um, increase that similarity yeah it, uh, it, i think like that makes sense of... or, or was that very confusing no that that makes a, a lot of sense uh, i think like um one thing is that i think what the previous question was is that what happens if uh, i may, i think they meant like for example when we are testing with 
uh chat gpt and it ends up giving the wrong answer then what do we do so we can't do anything so that's when you have to fix uh the stage before it gets deployed because um yeah i mean you can take those responses so like for example what chat gpt does is unless you go to the setting and you change it right now is that uh, unless you specify they will actually use the responses you used to train it again so what in essential it's doing is that when you talk to chat gpt and you go like no it's wrong it's actually going to make sure it records that data and when they actually train the model again it, they feed this sort of response back and hope the model learns again um but yeah you once it's deployed you can't do anything if it ends up giving the wrong answer it, it can again give the wrong answer as well but since the model is so large and it's taking different paths to get to the answer um there's a less likelihood that it might give the wrong answer again but if it's taken a certain path and it's giving you the wrong answer yeah it can like end up happening once in a while does that make sense um but yeah okay i just hope that yeah, i, and I, to, I also yeah. want to add here that um th this is also one of the challenges with productionizing llm apps because uh once a model goes down this wrong path it's very difficult to bring it back to the correct path as well um and also um in any production system you won't have like a human monitoring it right um like if you're running it at any good scale um so it's also very difficult to figure out whether the model has actually gone down a wrong path and then you know take corrective actions um uh, whether the corrective actions will work or not is is another challenge but the first challenge of actually figuring out whether the model has gone down that wrong path itself is also very difficult yeah, yeah. exactly um let me uh, jump on to this and uh, after this we just have the demo as such but i think like this is also pretty crucial because you need to make like design like i guess decisions along the way uh, in terms of designing your system as to when do you actually end up using rlhf do you want to end up using rlhf uh, so i made this like uh, flow chart i know it looks really big and complicated so let me just break it down um, so let's take an example of you know you have a model that's trained to write poems so in the beginning right uh, just give me one moment this okay so in the beginning um, you we would want to fine tune the model in a supervised manner using a data set of poems so have you firstly like when you want to progress into using rlhf the first question you have to ask yourself is have you already like built a supervised fine tune model if no then you need to first go and create that model if yes uh, then you move on to the next step so the next step is you want the model to start generating like satisfactory poems most of the time uh, we may decide to continue using fine tune and fine tuning the sft models so this means that you want the model uh, you you know you fine tune it more you give it more data around poems so that the model recognizes what it means to be a poet right so does your model perform satisfactorily on most task if yes then you continue to put in, uh, like use and potentially fine tune the sft models based on new data and now let us say that the model isn't performing well so it's like struggling on stuff like haikus right and um, like and simply providing it explicit labels for haiku in the sft training data does not correct the mistake right and in this case let me also take the pointer because okay so yeah so let us here right like let us say like it's not performing well on haikus so then you like figure out okay is there a pattern of mistakes and if there is a pattern of mistakes and is there a place where the fine tune fine tune model is underperforming if yes can the mistakes be corrected by performing like giving it more labels and uh, if it is then you augment your training data and you train it again um, and make sure the model sort of includes that if no then are you able to sort of uh, gather comparison data for so no firstly like consider collecting more diverse and you know representative data for uh, sft but 
even after you do that, your model still is able to not get those haiku. Like for example, you wanted to give a better response to write a haiku about a spring, then you would end up like going down the path. Like, are you able to gather comparison data for reward modeling? So this is where reward modeling kicks in. So only when you've tried out the other steps, go into reward modeling. So if you have sufficient computational resources and that's very important because again you're giving it these responses and you need to make sure you have labelers who can actually like be like okay this is the right response this is the wrong response then you uh go ahead and try reward modeling and if so you can end up having like better outputs to your haiku prompts uh, if not, if you don't have the computational resources, it's fine. You can go back to, you know, uh, working with SFTs and like fine tuning your model until it gets to a point where you think it's sounding better. So that's, uh, that is it about, uh, you know, RLHF and how to come to a conclusion when to use it. It's mostly about, I know a lot of this looks like trial and error. Like, you know, do I, I keep going back to the same thing of fine tuning, uh, but why that is so is that oftentimes when you actually end up doing real world use cases, you'll realize that you will be constrained in some or the other way. Maybe the budget is less, maybe you don't have that many people will go through what the model gave answers to because it is a very cumbersome process. I bet like OpenAI hired like thousands, if not like, you know, 10,000, 20,000 people at least to sit and label their data, right? So label their prompts, especially, and make sure that the model was performing well. And if you don't have that sort of resources, it's almost impossible to make sure that uh, you end up doing reward modeling or RLHF. So in that case, you have to go back to fine tuning and through the fine tuning process, I do believe you can get to a model that sounds better at doing the task you wanted to do. And so, yeah, I will go ahead and pass it on to Soham to sort of, uh, give the demo. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, okay. Um, I turn on. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I hope you can see my screen now. Um, yes, yeah. yes, you can. Okay, awesome. So what we'll do here is, um, uh, I think Archana mentioned about the reward model, right? Um, and then after that about the PPO, uh, the uh, 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 training uh, method as well. Um, so that's that's what we'll do today. Uh, we'll first train a reward model, um, and then we so, will... I'm sorry to interrupt. I I don't think I went through PPO. If you want to give a bit of context before uh, you okay. explain that, that'll yes. be great. Uh, let me see if I can get a diagram. Uh... Okay. Uh, can you see this uh, picture? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so here, here is what we'll do. Um, so ideally in your training data set, you have um, a query um, and then you pass it through um, a language model and you get a response. Uh, right. Now you can do this multiple times and get uh, different kinds of responses. Correct. Like that, the, if you un, if you ask ChatGPT the same question uh, multiple times, you will uh, um, or you regenerate the response. You will get multiple types of responses, uh, right? Um, so then, what we do is uh, we use a uh, we create what we call a reward model. Um, a reward model is something that uh, that uh, ranks the multiple responses that the model provides. Um, and you can have multiple, uh, you can have rules as to how to rank the responses. Uh, for instance, uh, one rule could be uh, for the human uh, could be like the model shouldn't be toxic, right? The output shouldn't be toxic. Um, so, so when you first train your LLM on, you know, all the data that's available on the internet, uh, you will have a lot of toxic data in there and the model may tend to generate um, toxic outputs, right? Uh, but then, uh, you know, if you have a reward model with a human uh, making sure that the uh, that only non-toxic outputs are given um, a higher uh, rating, 
uh, then um, then that'll be good, right? Uh, so that's what we do next, which is we create um, a data set uh, where we uh, rank responses and we choose like one or two um, really good responses for, for the same, for one query. Uh, we then train um, a model uh, that uh, that can classify whether a response is good or not. Um, for instance, um, let's say um, you want a model that's not toxic, right? Um, this reward model could actually be um, another language model uh, that is trained to classify toxic data, right? Um, uh, so for instance, one of the um, examples that is provided in Hugging Face is detoxifying a language model here. And what they'd use is they use a BERT-based model, like a transformer model uh, that's trained on toxic comments, if I'm not wrong. Um, and they use that to figure out whether the output from the LLM is toxic or not. And if it is toxic, then they give it a low reward. And if it is not toxic, then it gets a high reward, right? Um, so, so after this step, what we get is we get um, we get for a query we have multiple uh, multiple outputs and we have um, a score for each output based on you know whether it's toxic or or some other criteria, right? That's what we get here. Um, and then next, what we want to do next is we want to uh, fine tune our LLM um, to make sure that the outputs are closer to what the humans or the classifier ranked as good outputs. So, how do we do that? Um, so what we do is we we have our query plus response pair. Um, we have um, the normal the the base model, right? And and we have another model like it's the same model, but this is the model that that we are going to train. Uh, the reason we 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 use two um, uh, two versions of the same model is because later on uh, we want to make sure that uh, that the difference in the answers between what the fine tune model and the reference model is is outputting is not um, is not too far um, so so we want the the model that we're fine tuning uh, to not be toxic like with this example uh, but at the same time we don't want the outputs to be so far uh, away from our original model that that it becomes like you know a completely different model altogether that doesn't perform that well um, so that is why we we keep um, a reference model as well uh, that kind of uh, make sure that the outputs um, are not too far away as well. Um, I hope that makes sense. Um, and yeah, so we we uh, and, and so that that's what we're trying to do in this optimization uh, PPO stage. Um, so I'll quickly go over like um, so if there are no questions, uh, okay. Mm. Is there a question? What is the name of the job where programmers label the models? Um, yeah, um, that's just like um, data labeling. Um, so, you know, you can have uh, like people who are data labelers who just all they do is like, you might give them like multiple responses like this, and then they uh, compare the two responses and and choose which is better based on you know some predefined rules or based on what they feel sounds better, right? Um, so yeah, so so okay. Coming to the notebook, um, we'll use this library called TRL from Hugging Face. So we need to first install that. Um, then uh, we'll also be using um, PyTorch. Uh, we'll also be using datasets to get um, to fetch um, a dataset that we'll train on. Um, and yeah, from TRL, we'll, we'll, we'll um, input this uh, training uh, class called Reward Trainer. Um, so I'm using um, a data set that is provided by this open source company called uh, Argila. Um, and what they have is um, pairs of, uh, like for, for one prompt, they have two responses. Um, and, and there's categories for the responses as well. Um, and then um and and the reason why we have two responses is because one of the response i want to give like a high rating to and another um, a low rating right so that that's what the reward model will uh, will be doing um so yeah so this is what the data looks like we don't we won't really use the last three columns we'll just be using the first three um so now what i've done here is um i've just created a function that randomly chooses 
uh, one of these two responses. Um, I um, it's random, like so that it's faster. But in reality, you would have a human or or some other model evaluate the two um, responses. Um, so yeah. So after that, what we have is we have our question, uh, we have our uh, chosen uh, response, and we have a rejected uh, response, and and it's been chosen randomly. Um, next, what we'll do is we'll train our reward model. Um, the reward model does not need to be like a really large LLM. So here I've just chosen um, a Roberta based model. Um, and then I train it like, like you know, how you would um, typically train um, an LLM, uh, sorry, a bird based model. Um, and after training, so I've just trained it for like one epoch. Um, it's not that... Uh, um, like, like I, I, this is just an example. I haven't like trained it for the best accuracy and all. Um, but yeah, so after this step, uh, we now have um, a model that can give a score uh, for, for some answers, right? Um, so here, <clears throat> uh, you can see I've asked the prompt, what is deprecation? And then I have um, two answers here. Um, two of the answers that were in the data set. And we can now use the reward model uh, to give a score for which answer is better, right? Based on how we trained it before. And you can see that um, uh, that it has given um, a low score for the less preferred um, uh, response and a high score for the more preferred response. Um, and then uh, now that we have a reward model, uh, we can now um, start training our, um, uh, we can start optimizing the larger LLM using the reward model, right? Um, so for this, I've used the GPT-2 model um, because um, it's it's an LLM, but it's still small enough that you can train it at reasonable speed in Colab. Um, so remember, we need two models, right? We need um, our model that we're trying to um, uh, fine tune. And then we need the reference model, right? The ref we don't want our fine tuning model to give an answer that's too far away uh, from the reference model. Uh, we just want to make sure that the answers uh, follow some guidelines that the human reviewers have, um, have or, or, or the human intuition makes the answer sound better, right? Um, yeah, so, so training is pretty simple. Uh, we query, uh, we, have a, uh, we have the query tensor. We ask um, the the model to we ask both the models to generate an output, right? Um, here, uh, right, and then and then what we do is we also ask the reward model, um, to give a the to give a reward for the generated output, and now we can use the PPO trainer to compare the three. Um, so we have the query tensor, we have the response, and then we have the reward. And um, and ideally, this will optimize the model to make sure it performs um, in line with what the human reviewers want, right? Um, so yeah, so so this training kind of failed because I think um, the notebook ran out of memory. Uh, but you can see it trained for a few um, a few iterations, and um, and the loss was also decreasing. Um, yeah, so that that's pretty much it. Um, if I, I I'll I'll get I'll take some time to either um, reduce how much I train or um, you know fix the memory issue. Uh, but yeah, that that's pretty much it. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks a lot, Soham. Um, so yeah, that was like a quick demo into what is RLHF and what is you know capable in terms of if you want to do it on your own. And yeah, you are like as I said computational resources on your end will be less until you like either take like maybe let do it on the cloud or have your own GPU and um, the restraint is still going to come if you still like work on it at work and you know uh, even then you're going to have like limited compute so that is why when you progress to this stage you have to sort of ask yourself do I really need this or can I end up fine-tuning my model and so in the next session, uh, now we have covered like, you know, uh, the entire 
process is such so the next one i am hoping to do like a fun application using this and have like a fun notebook challenge uh, so notebook challenge is just like have a few points in the notebooks where you can uh, sit and complete and uh, you know we can all try to train like uh, like do an end to end application not train but like do end to end applications with llm maybe call the open ai um, api and try to do something specific um, and um, try to basically make something that's viable right and uh, that's what we'll be figuring out in the next session and then we'll be wrapping up because that's our last session and yeah um, do let us know if you have any feedback and if you have any questions as usual uh, we will be putting this up on tinyml.substack.com because we know like uh, what we said today is a lot of information and it can be hard to encapsulate everything it's okay if you felt somewhere in the session that oh i'm not able to follow through i will make sure to make it really uh, simple on the on the um, on the blog as well so just feel free to follow this and uh, you should be getting a newsletter pretty soon i have already added the content i'll just add the code and uh, send it out and yeah thank you so much everyone for coming in the session taking out the time today i i we really really appreciate it and you know we're very close to the end now and uh, we hope you turn up for the next session as well yeah thank you so much yeah thank you thank you archana and sohan for taking out time and giving us this absolutely wonderful presentation and uh, i i definitely appreciate all the gifs that you've added in between the slides it really um helps to remember because there's some anchor to you know like uh, relate to the content that you uh, you're also providing on the slides but it was a wonderful session thank you so much thank you thank you so much everyone hope you have a thank wonderful you. day ahead thank you to everyone who attended our session see you soon in the next session bye everyone bye bye